directions? All right, well, well, we did that on purpose, okay? I just wanted to see if we could just get you all confused in the morning. Also, I just want to remind again that we got our Wednesday service up and running at 7 p.m. Last Wednesday was a great Wednesday. It was really good with the prayer time we had. I uh, really enjoyed it, uh, so I encourage everybody to come on out for that. You'll be blessed by uh, having a time of prayer for that. Hopeless, helpless, sinner, lost, but the Alpha and Omega brought the answer to the cross. And that's where one day I found him, sin no longer left a stain. To this day it is a holy, perfect plan. I got fixed it all. process and his family and uh, appreciate all the church family here that uh, labored and uh, helped with the funeral and did all the things there and uh, the flowers out in the foyer next to the chair there uh, it was uh, given to the church by the Ward family there we appreciate that and, uh, so you uh, continue to keep uh, brother Charlie in your prayers a couple other uh, announcements on prayer requests today uh, Janet Brinkle and uh, Larry uh, Bolden we're both put on hospice this week, and so uh, pray for the Brinkle family and also the Bolden family there. And uh, Larry's over in uh, Greentown, 
at uh, the facility there. Miss Janet's over here at Miller Manor, and so keep them up in prayer. Then Miss Patty also, I actually didn't mention the brother uh, Matthew, but uh, when Pastor Matthew was taking the prayer request there, but she has a friend that she eats with over there at uh, Weymouth where she stays, and uh, her, her friend is struggling right now with her health to ask us to pray for her, and so uh, Miss Patty mentioned that uh, to me as I come by her, and so I'll mention that again to y'all. So do encourage you to be out on the Wednesday night service at 7 o'clock. Sunday night is at 6 o'clock. And so please keep them in mind. And uh, we have changed the format of the Wednesday night service and the ministry there of trying to help people to be more engaged in the service. And we pray that's going to be a help to you. And uh, we're just searching for what God would have us to do there. So come be part of that. We have a good time on Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Uh, here at the church. And so we encourage you to come be part of the Wednesday night service uh, as we get going here into the spring months. And and uh, look forward to a, a great, great time in God's house each time that we're able to meet. Well, my thoughts today, and as God uh, turned my heart uh, towards this Sunday sermon here, is to uh, deal with true conversion. Uh, when we are out in the public and you're out witnessing and evangelizing, when you're, uh, as this past week we did funerals and all that that comes along with that, uh, you know, we see a lot of people talking about uh, their belief in God. But if you listen to them a while, their belief in God and what God describes as a true biblical conversion of the Bible is way apart. And a lot of people that want to name the name of God don't really know who God is. And uh, if you know your scriptures and you understand that. And so as I, I've been praying about that and, and I've seen that over a lot of years, but it seems to be getting uh, worse as we're coming on down there and towards these end times, these last days where Christ is fixing to come back. And you begin to look at that and see, well, what is a true biblical conversion? How do you know that salvation is of God and not just some deception? Well, the Lord put my heart towards Acts chapter number 9. Acts 9. You're going to be introduced to a man here that God shows us a true biblical conversion. For those of you that are Bible read, you'll know that this is the man called Saul. Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus was a man that was a very religious man. And in his religion, uh, he was very devout and very zealous. And then he was going to a place called Damascus. And on the road to Damascus, he had a true biblical salvation. Yes. And that, my friend, is what God's explaining to us here. For those of you that are uh, Bible read also and have been in church, you'll know that Saul of Tarsus becomes the Apostle Paul. And so those of you that know your Bible will know that the Apostle Paul is spoken of. But Saul of Tarsus... You're only going to meet here a few times. In fact, there's three times in the book of Acts that this same event is recorded. Uh, you'll know him from back in Acts 6 where he stood there when Stephen was stoned for his faith uh, back there in Jerusalem. And uh, he was the young man there. But you're going to come to find him and, and know more about him. And I wish we had more time this morning. I could go into more that you'll truly see that he was converted because as you go down through the New Testament, you'll see the fruit of salvation in the Apostle Paul's life. And that is what I'm trying to bring out to you, get you that point, so that you understand who we're speaking of here. And it's just not a one-time event. My friend, salvation is not about when you kneel down and meet Christ. It's at that moment you're saved. But it will change your life from that moment forward. It, it, it makes a difference when God comes into your life. God calls you a new creature in Christ Jesus. And so we have to see the bigger picture. Now you say, well, you can't be saved if you don't have this life after salvation. All I can do is look at the fruit. I can't tell you whether you're saved or not. The only way you're going to know you're saved is when you stand before God. Because He will be your final judge. Now, I can go down through there and say, well, I like that person. I think he's going to heaven. Won't get you there. Or I can say, I don't like you. I don't believe you're going to go to heaven. I can't keep you out. Well, I don't agree with you. 
That's all right, I don't agree with myself at the time. That's not any problem. <laughs> you see, a lot of people want to put a lot of things in. But you know who has the last say? God does. Amen. And that's the one we want to research this one. That's the one we want to know about. So if you found your place there in Acts 9, we're going to begin reading in verse number 1. We'll read a little bit of a lengthy scripture here this morning so you can get a clear picture of what God's trying to show us. Here we read, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughtering against the disciples of the Lord, went to, unto the high priest and desired of him a letter uh, to Damascus, uh, to the synagogue, that if there be found any in the way, whether there be of men or women, that he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as they journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, and he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told to thee what thou must do. Verse 7, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a, a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But he, but they led him by the hand and brought him unto Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. And he, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and he was told uh, told him said. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, hear my Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street called Straight, and inquire the house of Judas, and the one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. Verse 12, And he uh, seen a vision, a man named Ananias, coming in and putting his hand on him, and he might receive sight. And Ananias answered the Lord, I have heard by many of this man, and how evil he hath done on the saints at Jerusalem. And there and here he hath authority of the chief priests to bind all that call upon thy name. And the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, and to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great a things he must suffer for my name's sake. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we pray thy blessings now upon this reading of the scripture. Lord, give us clarity of thought. Help us to have pure hearts. Help us to hear from heaven this morning. Lord, may we truly see exactly what you do in people's lives. Lord, may we know that you've worked in our life and we have a personal salvation that you have given us. It is the free gift of God in Christ Jesus. And Lord, may we see it for the work that you're doing in us. May we understand it for all that you have purposed and your plan and your will is for our lives. Lord, may we learn from this illustration that you give of Saul's life who became the Apostle Paul. Bless this congregation today. Give them ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, as you read down this discourse, you find here that Saul was a very religious man. If you would have probably stopped him on the streets of Jerusalem and asked him if he believed in God, he'd say, yep, I believe in God. I keep the Jewish law. I'm part of the Sanhedrin. I, I serve the high priest of the, of the tabernacle, of the temple. I, I follow after the uh, rites and the commandments and I do all the things. I am zealous for the Jewish faith. He was, and by all measurements, and if you would have held those beliefs, would have looked at him and said that truly he was a follower. But he stood against Christ and all the teaching of Christ, and he had persecuted there in Jerusalem to an extent that many of the Christians had fled or had been driven out 
or had been persecuted to the point that they had left Damascus and uh, the uh, Saul of Tarsus was at that point so enraged and so angry. In case you haven't figured it out, there can be some angry human beings in this world. There are people that you just can't get away from because they won't leave you alone. They're angry. They're mad at God, they're mad at the world, and they're mad at themselves. If you've listened to the news this week, you've seen one of those down there in Indianapolis. It is that grave of a situation. So, well, people ought not be that way. You need to be wise enough to understand people are that way. Have wisdom, have, have some experience, understand we live in a dark time. Say, well, I didn't do nothing to them. You don't have to do nothing to them. They think certain things. The preacher's going to move on, but here's Saul of Tarsus. The reason he was leaving Jerusalem and going 125 miles down to Damascus was he was an angry man. That if these people named the name of Jesus Christ, they deserve to be in prison. And he justified that in his mind. So he takes off and he goes down there to Damascus. He gets the high priest to write him an order or a decree. Because you know, you got to understand, in our day and age, we don't see that in, in this Western culture. But you go to a lot of places in the world and there are a lot of political power, a lot of religious powers that are hidden behind the scenes. <laughs> They have puppetry of people up there in the front. But there are certain things going on behind the scene there that you don't know about. And these people have power. There's a lot of evil powers in this world. The high priest had power over the synagogue there in Damascus, though he was 125 miles away there in Jerusalem. And so he writes a letter. And that letter gives Saul of Tarsus authority as he's moving on down there to persecute these uh, believers of Jesus Christ and how that they were going against him. And therefore, as he neared Damascus, there shined about him a great bright light. And he hears a voice. And he sees a figure. But no one else in his group sees it. Now they hear, but they don't see it. Saul of Tarsus says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He's laying there on the ground saying, who art thou? And he says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Now that was an eye-opening awakening in, this, in Saul's life. He got a glimpse of of the glory of God. Now, for those of you that's not been in, under preaching, biblical preaching, and, and you say, well, then God's always going to come in a vision. No. This was before the Scriptures were written and completed. We were having the Old Testament Scriptures, and you had them in the Hebrew and the Septuagint, which was the Greek, but the New Testament Scriptures were not yet completed. So God visited people with a vision. Because they didn't have the Bible. Our faith doesn't come from visions or uh, unctions or movings or, or dreams today. Our faith comes from the Scripture. He that believeth in God believes in God by faith. And you go to Romans chapter number 10, verse 17. I don't have time this morning. It tells you this. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the Word of God. God does not work contrary to this book. I don't care what the preacher tells you. I don't care what your grandmother told you. Now, I do care about your grandma. Don't, I'm not disrespecting your grandma. Don't go and say, preacher, don't love my grandma. No, I don't. I don't. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying your faith in God can only be placed within the Word of God. Only God can give you faith from His Word. And God does not work contrary to His Word. If you want to know you have a relationship with God, you better check the Scriptures. That's where it comes from. But here at this dispensation, this economy of time, God worked through visions and dreams and, and unctions there where He worked in this man's called Saul's life. 
and he showed him that he was a real and live and that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He opened up and spoke unto Saul. Saul seen him in that road to Damascus. And here we find that response and, and how he came to see who God was and what God was doing. You see, that's where we're finding true biblical salvation is understanding God. Move me Romans chapter number 9. Romans in the ninth chapter. Listen to the truth of the Scripture as He clearly proclaims the Word of God to us to make sure that your faith is in God, how that God is working your life just as much as He was in Saul's life when he knocked him to the ground. They're down in verse number 16. I'm just going to look at one verse here, and you can read this some more for yourself. It says, So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Understand, it's not your experience, it's what God does in your life. Amen. It's not because you picked yourself up by your own bootstraps. It's because God showed mercy to your soul. It's the working of God that we find within the Scriptures that tells us that God is bringing forth this life. It is faith in God. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter 16, you not only find out that it's faith in God, but you'll also find this about a true biblical conversion. It is because that a person comes to understand that they are a sinner. No place within the Scripture do you ever find a person that has a true biblical salvation has come to God without knowing themselves as a sinner. And we have to understand that this culture that we're living in don't see themselves as sinners. You know, we'd much rather go over here and look at Brother Brian here and say, well, now, Brian, you don't do this right and this right and this right, so I'm better than you. Okay, I'm all right. <laughs> Compared to Brian, I'm doing good. Well, Brian could go over to Miss Susie and say, well, now Miss Susie, you do it, it, it. And so Brian says, I'm good. <laughs> Friend, no person in this world is not a sinner. I don't care where you were raised at. I don't care what kind of family <laughs> heritage you have. I don't care if your grandfather, your great-grandfather, and your father were preachers. It won't get you to heaven. I don't care if you've been in church ever since you've been on the roll in the nursery and now you're on the roll of the more experienced. <laughs> you may be the oldest person in this building this morning. <coughs> that doesn't make you a Christian. And yet, when we find ourselves in the sight of this thing, you hear it over there in Acts 9, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? God called him into account for his sin. Listen, God's going to call you into account for your sin. No matter how you see yourself, no matter how others see yourself, it is God that you're going to give an answer to. It, 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 this mirage that we put on out there today that, you know, we are somebody that we're not. And there's so many in this, this culture today with this mass media and, and, and with the social media and, and all these things. You know, we try to appear to be somebody that we're not. My friend, God knows who you are. Don't, don't leave the church family think, you know, well, I fooled God. I came to church this morning. You didn't fool God. You didn't even come close. So why I fooled the preacher? Well, that ain't hard. <laughs> why well, fooled my mama? Well, that's more difficult. I admit. But your mama gave you birth, and she'll give you a lot more grace and a lot more love than you deserve. She'll look past everything in your life because she loves you. But my friends, you're going to answer to God. Saul learned that on the road to Damascus. 
He's seen himself as a sinner. And if you're going to look for true biblical conversion this morning, you've got to find those that see themselves as sinners. When a person wants to only tell you about what they're doing and not what God did, they don't see themselves as a sinner. Because see, there's a true conviction that comes upon a heart and a life of a person that comes unto God for salvation. That conviction draws us to God. It causes us to understand the working that God is doing in us. When Saul was laying there on the road to Damascus and God showed Himself mightily in his life and God drew him and God brought him into the family of God by grace and mercy, Saul asked God, what do you have me to do? What is it that you want me to do? And he said, go to the street called Straight in the city, the city of Damascus there, and you wait there and I'll show you what's going to be done next. And you find there that Saul gets up off the ground and he's blind now. And he moves into the city of Damascus. And he spends there three days and three nights. The Bible tells us in prayer. But he also tells us that he neither ate nor drank. Now, he wasn't yet a Baptist. So that's, we can tell that right away. You heard Brother uh, Harold Noble the other day at the uh, fellowship here at, at, at Friendship. We had Brother Harold Noble with us, our missionary. And he said there's three kinds of Baptists in this world. Southern Baptists, Free Will Baptists, and Free Meal Baptists. <laughs> that's a joke that's not <laughs> those are the folks that you look at and you think how do you know God did something in your life because your life now changes from that time that Saul was laying there on that road to Damascus to the time that he was in that street called Straight in the house of Judas there he was there praying and searching and watching to see what God was going to do. God had begun to so work in his life that his whole world changed. He didn't eat. He didn't drink. He prayed and sought the face of God to see what God was going to do in his life. What God was purposed. And there we find that obedience, there we find that growth. There we begin to see the journey, the transformation that is now going to happen. And I can take you throughout the Bible and you'll find those days of, of the working of God. Think about Jonah of the Old Testament. Remember Jonah and the great fish and, and, the, and, the, and the belly of that great fish. He was there three days and three nights before he went off to Nineveh. Jesus was three days and three nights in the tomb, laying there, uh, going from place to place to deal with the spiritual matters, the new life that would be given. And when He rose from the grave at that third day, He was victorious over death and hell in the grave. Amen. Saul of Tarsus is now in the street called Straight, and three days and three nights, He's there as God begins to move and God begins to transform him, taking him from the man of hatred and the man of anger and the man that breathed out these great threatenings and now bringing him into the family and the will of God and showing him the great work of God. You see a true mark of conversion here. He brings forth that revived life. Down there in verse number 11 of Acts 9, it is that seeking and praying now not for what he wanted but what for what God wanted it brought forth that truth that it was God that was now in control of his life he was honestly praying communing with God allowing God to be in control of his life it wasn't what Saul wanted he was seeking what God now wanted and that new life was bringing forth that which God had done within him. He brought forth that truth of all that God means to do in his life. Now then God brings forth this man called Annas. And this Annas then is told to go to the street called Straight. Meet this one called Saul of Tarsus. And to pray for him because he prayeth. Now God begins to work and to begin to move in his life. He's going to bring forth this new life 
that God had shown for him. He's going to bring forth the fruit. He's going to bring forth the revelation of all that's being done. And here we find that Anna struggles with what's happening here. He begins to understand what's happening, but now he's got to see what God is going to do with this. Look on down to verse 17. Christian, there's a lot of things in this life that you simply got to trust God to do. It's not going to make sense. And we had time we could back up here to verse 13, 14, and 15, and you can see the, the working between those things. Christian, your life's not going to be without struggles. But if you're truly a child of God, you're going to follow after God. Amen. Now watch it, verse 17. And Annas went to his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, hath appeared unto thee in the way that thou camest and hath sent me, and thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now here, as Annas got confirmation from God of what God was doing and bringing forth the truth of God in his life, he didn't allow his fears to control his life. You see, earlier, if you'll read back there in Acts chapter number 9, he argued with God. Now God, do you know who this Saul of Tarsus is? Now, Christian, think about this. What is it that God doesn't know? You're talking to the Almighty God. The omniscient, the all-knowing God. But we're going to tell Him, you know what I've heard? He's created all kinds of problems back there in Jerusalem. He's committed all kinds of crime against the church and, and He's persecuted the church of Jesus Christ and now He's come to Damascus with the order of the high priest and He's going to kill people in Damascus. And you want me to go down there? Now, if you Christians haven't been there yet, you haven't walked with God far enough. There's times when your mindset and your heart is going to conflict. Because the human mind's going to say, let me reason with you, God. And your heart <coughs> is going to say, yes, Lord. But you've got to get out of your head and into your heart and down to your feet to get up and go down to the street called the straight and meet this one called Saul of Tarsus. Now, you'll never see God work until you trust Him by faith. Amen. And you step out of your reasoning, out of your comfort zone, out of your fears, and let God have control of your life. Amen. And when Anna stepped out and went down there and prayed, not only did Saul of Tarsus receive sight that day, but he also received the working in the Holy Spirit of God into his life. And you'll find there that he was baptized he, before he ate, before he drank, after God gave him his sight back and the Holy Spirit of God moved upon his life, he went and got baptized and grow and, and see the grace of God work in his life. There was a new direction. There's a new purpose in his life. He's now being used for the Master's use. He's now seeing himself as one that is a servant of Jesus Christ. He's now looking for the great things that God's called him to do, to be the witness to the Gentiles and the kings and to the Jews and to be the one that would be the great apostle Paul. He is the one that God is working in his life. There's a change. There's a new life. There's a, there's a moving of God because he, like Annas, was submitting himself to God and allowing God to have control of his life. He therefore seen the working of the power of God and seen the hand of God in his life. Over in 1 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse 16, here's how that he concluded as he came towards the end of his life as he's helping young Timothy, the young preacher, come along in the faith. 
It says in 1 Timothy 1 and 16, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, not uh, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on Him into life everlasting. You see, when the Apostle Paul was mentoring young Timothy along and leading him in the right direction, he said, God not only saved me for me, God saved me to be an example unto others. God led me to be a witness. God led me to show forth His mercy and His grace, not only to save my soul, but to bring me into this ministry to allow me to touch and to follow and allow others to follow me and to have the ways of God and the power of God in our lives. And we see that and we understand that. Friend, we're not here for us. We're here to do the Father's will. We're not here simply to say, well, now I'm going to heaven and all mine with me. I've got nothing more to be concerned about. God put you here to be a, an example, a witness, a testimony, a help unto all those that are around you, that are influenced in your life. God has allowed us to see the work and to know what God is doing within us. Understand that when God moves in, there is a realization of all the power of God upon a soul. It is God that saves us. It is God that convicts us that we're a sinner. It is God that now brings us into His purpose and His will for our life. It is seeing and having the will of God and knowing the power of God that is now upon us. It is knowing that God is the one that brought forth true biblical salvation. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 this way, For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge. If one died for all, then we are all dead. And he that died for all, then they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Amen. That's the life that we have in Christ Jesus. That's the newness that we have in Christ. You see, true <coughs> biblical salvation is the work of God. It's the free gift of salvation that comes from God unto you. It is the knowledge that God is the one that is working in your life. It is the understanding and seeing the hand of God. It is knowing the conviction of God. Knowing that you're a sinner without hope, without any means of deliverance. It's not what I'm doing, but what God is doing in me. It is understanding that it is something that I cannot explain to you. There's no human reasoning. There, there's not a, an explanation. You know, he was probably the most unlikely candidate to ever be saved. Saul of Tarsus was not a follower of Jesus Christ. He didn't have his act together. He didn't go down to Damascus thinking, boy, God will be a good deal when he gets me. God will be blessed. When he hit that ground on the road to Damascus, he had nothing to offer but to plead out and to follow exactly what God was saying for him to do. Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And there, my friend, is where Saul of Tarsus met Jesus Christ Amen. as a Savior. Amen. And there is where you'll meet Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. When you realize it's not me, it's God. Amen. Have you met Him? Do you know Him today? Is Christ your Lord today? Do you have true salvation, true conversion of your soul? We're going to have invitation. I suppose Bob to step up. He's going to pick up the songbook on 349, and he's going to sing softly and tenderly. We ask that you would likewise listen to these words. Understand that if God's working in your life, God wants to bring you salvation. He wants you to see 
how he's working. And by faith, step out and to trust him as your Savior. To know that it is God that's doing it. It's not me. you know that today. Pray that you walk with Christ and truly it is what God has done Amen. in your life. Amen.